I want to welcome you to the Yachts Commons tonight. Uh, a couple of housekeeping things. Restrooms are at the far end of the hallway. And we have a sign-up list on the table. We promise not to solicit you. Uh, we won't sell it. We will send you an email about any of our events coming up. That's all, the only reason we have that out there. A uh, little history on tonight's presentation. Tom Kearns, who's part of our, our board, took on the role of contacting Noah to see if we could have a presentation. And it was a very cordial response. Oh, yes, we definitely want to do it. He tried to figure out a date, and the person he's talking to, the commander, said, well, we don't know. Um, the boats are out there until end of October, sometimes November. And they don't come back in until the seas start getting pretty rough. So along about the middle of October, I saw a picture in the News Times front page of Noah's ship tied up at the docks in South Beach. So I said, Tom, get, get in touch with Noah. We booked three Saturday nights in November, not knowing which night we had a speaker available. So sure enough, the government shut down, brought all those boats back into dock early. So we're very fortunate. We got uh, tonight's presentation. I had several emails from Commander Brennan. Uh, some questions, some of it was technical with the projector and so forth. A couple of them were, what is the attire? I plan to wear my, my service dress, blue uniform, jacket and tie. Um, barring any more formal attire. So, and then, then he had another question. Um, is there any, I have a hard time reading this. Is there any available space I'd like to bring my support crew? And I think, all right, the whole crew from the ship is going to be there. <laughs> well, when I read the email further, his support crew is his lovely wife and his two young sons that are sitting right here. So, we're going to Well, I responded back to Commander Brennan. I said, Dear Commander Brennan, this is Yahats. We are not strange, just a little different and independent. And you're welcome to bring your support crew. He responded, Don, sounds perfect. The uniform is a requirement on my end, so no effort to impress. I wasn't expecting a white tie affair, but it's always good to ask. By the way, Noah thrives on different and independent. <laughs> Commander Brennan is the commanding officer of NOAA's ship, the Rainier, and it is in the process of mapping the ocean floor right off our coast. I don't know if you remember when uh, NOAA was considering moving to the Newport area. Uh, they were based in the Puget Sound, and Washington State came up with an argument that the Newport South Beach site wasn't really good because it was in the tsunami zone. And I thought about that for a while. I'm going, is there any deep port in the world that's not in the tsunami zone? <laughs> so that argument didn't hold weight at all. But uh, Oregon prevailed, and Noah built a brand new facility in South Beach, and we're very happy on the Central Coast to have their presence here and the work that they're doing. So, Commander Brennan, welcome to Yachts, welcome to the Academy. We're looking forward to it. appreciate the opportunity to speak with you this evening. Uh, it's nice to be in such a uh, warmly welcoming crowd. Typically, I have to say, you know, who's heard of NOAA? And so, luckily, in this area, um, the, the Oregon coast is amazingly NOAA literate, and that's, that's a real pleasure. So not only do they know what NOAA stands for, but they typically know what our ships do, each ship, and where they go, and what their mission is. So that is, that is amazing, because and many of the ports that I've worked out of, uh, you know, we could leave under the cover of darkness and nobody would ever know. Um, so here, NOAA is a big thing and that's, that's great and we love that. So, but one question I will ask you though is, you may have heard of NOAA, but who's heard of the NOAA Corps? Does anybody know what that is? <laughs> well, good. Well, I will hope to, I hope to, uh, fill you in on what the NOAA Corps is. That's why I'm in uniform every, you know, I imagine a number of people probably thought, well, you know, that's funny, why is this guy coming in a Navy uniform? 
And this is actually a NOAA unit form, and, and uh, so just real briefly, I'll get into it a little bit more in my talk, but uh, the United States has seven uniformed services. Most people know that you've got the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and the Coast Guard. Those are the first five. Well, the sixth one is the Public Health Service, so some of you may remember uh, C. Everett Coop. He was a Surgeon General, actually had an Admiral's rank, and he wore a uniform very much like this. The only difference was is that his sleeve insignia was a medical insignia, and ours is a, is the, is a geodetic symbol on our, on our sleeve. Uh, a Navy uniform would have a star here. So we are the seventh service uh, in that regard. And I'll talk a little bit more about why it's a Navy uniform and not some other uniform. Um, so anyways, but first I'd like to take you back, because what I, I think most people don't realize is that we have a very long and rich history. So we're NOAA now, but we actually started off as the Coast Survey, and that's, that's where I'd like to take you back first in our discussion about ocean mapping, because I think that's where it all starts. And, and I think before you start looking forward, you always gotta go back a little bit. And so I, I think it's interesting if you'll indulge me a little bit, we'll, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about that. So back in the early 1800s, um, over in Europe, we had the Napoleonic Wars underway, and the uh, British Navy was at its, at its peak. And we were stri uh, struggling very hard to remain neutral at that time. And that neutrality meant um, real economic prosperity for the United States. Our shipping was booming. We were taking our goods across the oceans and, and, and either running blockades or through agreements were able to get into many of the European ports and ports around the world that, that were blockaded. So our maritime industry was, was at that point second to none, not, not necessarily our military, uh, our Navy, but our, our, certainly our merchant mariners were all over the world. Um, if you looked at the east coast of the United States, which was pretty much where all of our civilization was, the roads connecting north and south along the coastline were very poor. Um, and the issue that we had at the time, back in, in the early 1800s, particularly when Thomas Jefferson uh, took over, was the fact that uh, at that time, roads were so impassable that it was that you, you couldn't go a quarter of a mile before your coach driver would have to hop off the wagon with an ax and cut his way through just to make way along the coastline north and south. And our ships, were, we were losing more ships at that time in the early 1800s to shipwrecks on shoals and rocks along our coastline than we were to, to any of the Navy forces or the British Navy forces at that time. And so Thomas Jefferson being a, a real man of science, I mean, in 1807, two years before he had actually just launched the uh, Lewis and Clark expedition. So uh, one of the very first scientific expeditions in the United States. In 1807, he launched the survey of the coast, and that was that is the genesis for which NOAA currently recognizes its scientific roots. So that was the start of NOAA's um, NOAA as a science agency. So that survey of the coast uh, was uh, started by an act of Congress in 18, uh, 1811. Uh, we hired um, Ferdinand Hassler. He was a, a Swiss, a Swiss um, trigonometric surveyor. He had been working on the trigonometric survey in Europe, and he came. Uh, he had immigrated to the United States. Actually, was working at uh, King, uh, at the uh, at West Point as an instructor at West Point. And it wasn't until 1811, because the government didn't move any faster in, in 1807 than it does now. <laughs> they actually hired. Ferdinand Hassler in 1811 to be the director of the Survey of the Coast at that time. From that point, he started he started uh, a whole um, effort to, to buy equipment. We had no survey equipment at that time. Today, you may see surveyors along the road with their tripods set up, and they have a very nice little instrument that looks like a telescope that sits on top of it, and they call them total stations today or in more traditional terms, it's called a theodolite. So that theodolite today is, is probably about as big as a loaf of bread. The theodolites back in 1807 were so big that you needed a team of horses to pull them in a wagon across country, and they weighed several thousand pounds. 
So we had to procure those, have those instruments made. So it was several years for that to happen. And then, of course, now we're at about the War of 1812. Things slowed down quite a bit. And before they could do any surveying anywhere on the coast offshore, they needed to establish horizontal control or basically known locations on the, on the beach. And so it took about 18 years for us to establish those shoreside positions before we could even send um, boats offshore to begin surveying the approaches. So that first effort was establishing a, a one nautical mile baseline on Fire Island in New York. And, and it was, like I said, it was 18 years later that we actually started acquiring the first sounding measurements. Um, so once that actually got underway, um, I believe it was in 18, between 1834 and 1836, the Navy actually had control of the Coast Survey. So even though they, they used Navy vessels to do those survey, all that survey effort, and so the people in command of those Navy vessels were obviously Navy officers. And so we currently trace our lineage back to that, which is why we still wear a Navy uniform today. So the Navy, Navy officers were in charge of NOAA ships, or I'm sorry, at that time, Coast and Geodetic Survey ships, all the way up until the early 1900s. And at that point, uh, they became somewhat organic and were able to hire their own people and pay for them. And, and so they became employees of, of Coast and Geodetic Survey at that time. But up until that time, it was, it was, it was uh, manned entirely by Navy uh, personnel. So we, we share a common history at some point uh, in those early mapping days with, with the Navy. So flash forward to today. We've got, uh, when you look at the shipping that comes into the United States, 53% um, of, of the, the import by value comes in through water. 38% of our exports go out by water. If you look at it by tonnage, 78% of, of the products that we export out of the United States, mostly brake bulk cargo, grain, gravel, coal, et cetera, all of those things go out by some sort of um, waterborne commerce. 90% of the consumable or the consumer goods that you find at your Walmart stores, your Lowe's, et cetera, all of those things, 90% of that comes in by waterborne commerce, our ships coming into port. So that is, that is what our current focus is. It has remained. It's basically the you know, we focused on commerce back in 1807, and that, that focus on commerce and getting maritime commerce in to our ports safely and effect efficiently has been, our, has been our overarching goal through that entire time. Certainly in recent years with the advent of technology, um, we've been able to branch out and do other things with that technology, and I'll tell you about that a little later in the presentation. But, this is one of the largest ships. This is what they call an ultra-large crew carrier. This carries petroleum products. This vessel is so big, it's, a, it's about 1,300 feet long. It's over 200 feet wide. Um, and they have a draft anywhere from, draft meaning um, from the water line to the bottom of the keel for those not in the maritime industry. That depth is anywhere from 80 to 100 feet deep. So this vessel, you will never see this typically in any one of our ports here in the United States. They do call down in the Gulf of Mexico, but they don't call at a port. They call at a port that's about 80 miles offshore south of, of uh, New Orleans called the Loop. It's the Louisiana offshore oil platform. And they have, to, they have to pull in there because that's the only place that the water is deep enough for them to get to any kind of a, a pier facility. And so all of that, all the stuff that they load and unload has to go from pipes out to that to actually be loaded onto the ships. These ships are tremendous. What you typically will see if you're in any port here in the U.S. is a container ship. So this is the port of Oakland. And these container ships are getting as large as those ultra-large crude carriers. They don't have the same depth, obviously, because they come into port. But they're still significantly large. So just to paint a picture of that for you, one of those ships has what we call 15,000 TEUs. So a TEU is a 20-foot equivalent unit. And so that's basically kind of like the short semi-tractor trailers that you see driving around the roads. 
Sometimes they have ones that are double that, so it's a 40-foot equivalent unit. But it's basically two of those containers. So that, that one ship can hold 15,000 of those containers. The latest triple E class can hold 18,000 of those containers. So if you imagine one of, one of these ships pulling into the port, now the last port that I worked in was in Norfolk, Virginia. When one of those pulled in, if you were to line up tractor trailer trucks and have them queued up to pick up one of those things in a single file line, that line of tractor trailer trucks would go from Norfolk, Virginia to New York City to pick up all of those, to pick up all those containers. They're tremendous. They're really amazing. And so you can see that yellow box in this image here shows the dimensions of the largest vessel that can go through the Panama Canal. So these exceed that. These will even exceed the, the new, uh, newly widened portions of the Panama Canal that are scheduled to open up uh, this coming summer. So they're, they're not designed to be able to go through the Panama Canal. Typically, these ships just do transoceanic voyages. So they run from Hong Kong to here and back uh, you know, to the west coast of the US and back again mostly. And you'll see some of them on the east coast as well doing European runs. So they're, they're tremendously large vessels. Just to show you some of the stats for me, because I'm kind of a ship geek and I really find them very interesting. So I'll just share it with you. Um, so this is the Emma Maersk. Maersk is probably one of the biggest uh, container shipping lines in the world right now. This is the latest one that they brought out. And so here, here are the, let me click down to, if I can get to it, the stats for that. So she's 1,302 feet long. She's got a width of 207 feet. So she's pretty much about the same size as, uh, as one of those ultra large crude carriers. She can cruise at a speed of 31 miles an hour and arrive four days before the last generation of ships which can only travel 18 to 20 miles an hour between China and California. She has a crew of only 13 people. Now, my little 231-foot ship has 45 people on it, um, just to run that. So just to give you a, a, a bit of a, a comparison there. She has a net cargo of 123,200 tons. Uh, she can carry 15,000 TEUs. And like I said, they haven't even built the next class of these, which is the triple E, the next largest, which is the triple E class, which is moving into the 18,000 TEU size, too big for Panama or the Suez Canal. And this was one thing that I found really interesting, that they've got a special silicone paint that they apply on the underbody or the underside of the ship, the below water part, that allows the ship to save three, 300,000 gallons of diesel fuel per year because it's just so slick and slides through the water with such little resistance. So amazing. Uh, technology in, in, the, in the ships of these sizes. So, my job is to make sure that this does not happen. Because those ships don't always know where they are, and they still, even though they're that big, they still have some, you know, a single human being like me standing on the bridge of that ship driving it, just like you drive your car, for more or less. So. They need to know where they're at and they need to be able to rely on the data that we provide on our nautical charts and, and, and hope that that, well, they, that that is actually accurate. And so that's what our mission is, is to make sure that the chart data for what they use on the bridge of their ship is, is accurate and timely. Where would, where would that happen? That's somewhere on the inside passage in, in, uh, up in Canada. So uh, I, I don't exactly know what got it there. I think they got spun around. but. Uh, Clearly, it wasn't a good day for that captain. <laughs> so, one thing about this, particularly in, in, in this area, and a, in a question that I get quite asked quite frequently is, well, does the bottom change? Well, the bottom changes dramatically. And, you know, it depends on the area, but there are certain areas around the country where, you know, we survey almost monthly. So, if you look at uh, Southwest or Southwest Pass in Louisiana, um, you know, all of the basically all the sediment that's getting carried down the Mississippi River gets dumped on that delta, and so the accretion values there, you know, are on the order of inches per day. So they have dredges out there constantly. Um, you may remember it was about four or five years ago, uh, one of the Cruise West ships up in Alaska had gone up into um, Glacier Park there, and and uh, the chart had shown. 
I believe, a, a 60 fathom sounding there, and they cruised in, weren't paying attention to their fathometer, and ended up running aground. And that, that sounding had come from one of our surveys, one of my ship's surveys, that had only been done about you know eight years prior. And in that time, you know, 80 fathoms, or I'm sorry, 60 fathoms of sediment had built up in that exact location that come from, from the glaciers there in that park. So it's, you know, in the right area, the bottom changes, you know, by the minute. So, so this is my ship bringing you aboard of what I do. No ship right here, we're, as we said, are right here out of Newport, Oregon. We have a crew of about 45 people, and the ship is, uh, well, she's as old as I am. So she's 45 years old. She's been surveying since 1968, and almost entirely that, that uh, during that time, she's been surveying in Alaska. Um, we have been, we do do some surveying south of here, um, but very rarely, because most of the West Coast ports are very deep, and most of them are also very well surveyed. Um, but in Alaska, the, the ports in the areas up there, as I'll show you in just a minute, are, are very poorly charted. So this is basically what we do. I've got a brief animation that kind of shows how, how the ship works. So we have um, a sonar on the hull of the ship. That sonar sends sound down to the seafloor. The sound bounces back. We record how long it took that sound to get down and back. Divide it uh, by two and, and divide by 1500, which is nominally the speed of sound, and, you, and that turns out to be the distance from the ship to the seafloor. Well, the water surface is never staying still because, as you know, the tide comes in and the tide goes out. So we're we're also at the same time have a tide gauge that we have to install, and so we're acquiring tide gauge data or tide data um, on shore. Um, as you also may know, if you've ever been out on a boat, that they, they don't stay still either. They're rocking and rolling around and going over the sea. So we have sensors on board that measure that as well. So they measure our heave, pitch, and roll. And then we also have to know our position. So we have GPS antennas on board the ship that measure our position from anywhere, anywhere up from four up to 24 satellites. And then we also have, a, because those satellites aren't perfect, we actually have a receiver on shore that's measuring that. So we have to acquire all of that data and, and sift it together so that when it comes out, we have an accurate measurement of that water depth on the seafloor at any given location in space. And it takes a long time to do that. So this is, um, this is one of our surveys from this summer. Um, just to give you, a, just to give you an idea, this is this is about eight to ten miles north south, and about eighteen miles wide. Um, this one little spot, I don't know if you can see it. There's kind of this uh, this line right here. That's approximately one swath from one line that the ship ran north south. So she would run that line. We started at the north end, ran south. That's how much coverage we get of the seafloor on one pass. So it's like mowing a really big yard. <laughs> so it takes a long time to mow that, that lawn. So um, if you put that together, you put that together with all the other surveys that we did, this was, this was our entire project. This was our summer project this year. Yes, sir. At least a, you before compared it to a lawnmower. In a lawnmower, at least you know what you've done. You're <laughs> right. Like, that's a good point because yeah. we don't always know what we've done. And, yeah. And that's a good point. Absolutely. So it's only after we do all of that processes and when we have to blend all that data together, that's the only time that we know. And sometimes, you know what? We have to go back and mow that lawn again. <laughs> So this area here is about 380 square nautical miles of, of territory that we covered. This was previously almost entirely uncharted. This is in the Shumigan Islands in Alaska, so I don't know if you can see, there's a little red dot right there. That's where that project area is, and it's probably about the size of that star on there. So when you look at the state of Alaska, it's a really small, small area. We've been surveying in that area 
for almost 10 years now and have covered an area the size of Rhode Island and it's barely a dent. So um, I believe we have over 4,000 linear nautical miles that, of, of lines that we had to run to just cover this area. And like I said, it's about 340 square nautical miles um, of this entire area. And, and that took us about, about uh, I think it was about 45 to 50 days to do that. And we had several other projects around. So just to give you an idea on how long it takes us to cover a certain amount of, of C4. Now, we have, we have 500,000 um, square nautical miles of area that NOAA is responsible for that we call our critical area. And we have about 3.4 million square nautical miles that's basically from our coastline out to the, the exclusive economic zone, which is 200 miles offshore, that we are responsible for charting. So you can see at, at doing only about, you know, I think last year we did about 600 square nautical miles a year, trying to cover the entire area that we have a responsibility to cover is, is a huge task. So, yes, sir. I'm just curious how much fuel it takes to go a nautical mile? Or um, how much fuel that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. How, how much fuel it takes to go one nautical mile? It's a... Uh, that's a good question. So we're, it depends on what we're doing, I guess, is the, is the, is the, is the short answer. Uh, because we may be anchored and we may have four launches running. So if I go back to the one image, you can see we have four small boats on board. So all this work is not done by just the ship. We have the ship and then we have four small boats that go out and have the same capability and, and they will get in. So, you know, we don't want to get the ship near this island at all. We'd rather stay offshore. So we will do these open areas like this, and then the launches go in and work this area. So they're pretty fuel efficient. The ship, um, I think we burn about a, you know, a thousand gallons a day if the ship is running full speed ahead, which is about where we survey. We survey about 10 knots. So that's a, that's a rough estimate of, of what we do a day. So. I, I'm going to not commit math in public here. Um, and, and I'll leave that to you. But um, that's about what we burn on a daily basis um, for fuel. So, yes, sir. I tend to keep my feet on solid ground. Um, you explain where the medians, a fathom, a nautical mile, and a uh, one other term. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, you're going to stretch my memory on a league. I believe a league is a thousand fathoms, but I'm not sure about that. Um, somebody in here who's got an iPhone, I'm sure, could find that out. <laughs> in uh, fathom is six feet. A nautical mile is 1,852 meters, um, or it's one one minute of arc. Of, of latitude. Was there one other one in there? We league, fathom, and what's it? And a nautical mile. So a nautical mile, I guess, is, is just um, is just a little less than uh, is just a little less than a, a statute mile. Is one nautical mile per hour. So if you're going one knot or the wind is blowing one knot, that means that it's going one nautical mile per hour. Yes, sir. So just to give you an idea on, on how much is on our plate, here's the state of Alaska laid over the rest of the US. So in that last 45 years that I was telling you about that we've been surveying up in Alaska, we've basically done this little bit right down here. So this is southeast Alaska, which is about as big as you can see, is about as big as the peninsula of Florida. And so we're, we've almost, we have very little left to survey down here. So now most of that work is up. That's why I brought my support team. The league is three statute miles or approximately 4,828 meters. Thank you. 
Um, so, and you can see this past uh, uh, last summer, um, our sister ship, the Fairweather, um, she actually went up and it started to push up into up around Barrow. She did a reconnaissance survey up up there um, because as the ice recedes, we're getting more and more ice-free days up around Barrow. And and this is actually the shortest route if you wanted to leave, like if you were, you know, in the uh, Maritimes in Canada, and you wanted to come up or around and go to China or anywhere in Asia, that's the shortest route up over the top. Um, and so coming up over that is there, but there, there's very few soundings up in that area. Most of the soundings have come from submarines as they've gone under the ice up there. And so they're, they're, you know, the soundings are very sparse and, and are not tied to any data because they're, you know, because they've they're floating in between the ice and the seafloor. Um, so we have quite a large area to, to do. So all of our work now is focusing basically from Kodiak Island and, and uh, west. So it takes us pretty much a, a full seven days to get from Newport uh, to Kodiak, you know, before we can even start surveying. So, I'm a hydrographer, I make nautical charts, and I acquire data on the seafloor. So I hope that you'll follow with me. This is, a, this, is, this is hydrographic art here. So this is actually some of the data that we acquired on the seafloor. And, um, and so I, wanted to, I just wanted to take a minute again. I, I've got a couple of things that I'm a little geeky about, and this was one of them. So I figured, I, if, you know, again, if you'll indulge me, we'll go through this. So, this is the seafloor off of one of the small islands that's just west of Kodiak called Chirikov. Now this is a pear-shaped island that's, you know, it's probably about 20 miles long by 15 miles wide and is populated by nothing but feral cows. Um, but offshore of that is, a, I mean, that's, that's a true story, um, offshore of that we found this, this here and uh, what's interesting about it is there is a, there is a, um, geologic fault that runs through here. And so you can see where you've got uh, these swirls here, and it, when you, I couldn't fit it all into the picture, but if you zoomed out, basically you would see where this swirl here is supposed to pick up with that swirl. So basically, the bottom of the seafloor has shifted. You know, so there are two tectonic plates, one here and one here, and those have slid past each other. And so what was on the seafloor right here, you know, is over here now. So th there's a, basically a giant rift in the seafloor there. So when I said that we're exploring that other 70% of the, the world, this is what we're, this is how we're doing it because we get to see the seafloor in a manner that nobody else has ever seen it. And we get to see it first. And for me, I think that that's really, really exciting. Yes, sir. Um, are there any, have there been any earthquakes along that fault recently? Not, well, as a matter of fact, there have been, and that's a great question. Um, they, we had an earthquake, several earthquakes this summer, and if you go to um, some of the Alaska earthquake or the Alaska tectonic page, um, it's a web page up there, you'll see that they actually happen all the time. But they're just so small that people don't typically feel them, and luckily on a ship we don't feel the, the earthquakes there, but they have they have earthquakes quite regularly all throughout the Aleutian Peninsula there, and they also have volcanoes erupt quite regularly there, which we saw several this summer that were erupting. So that's why those cows went feral. <laughs> that's why. They, yeah, that, they, that probably makes them a little, a little crazy. So this is another thing. Uh, if you walk along the shoreline here on any one of the beaches. Anywhere where you have running water and you have sand or some sort of a sediment, you'll see sand waves. We see sand waves in our data as well, so this is, that's what you're seeing here, this kind of pattern. So this was in, a, in Kazuyak Bay um, on Kodiak Island, and these were the sand waves, and we had a pretty good current that flowed back and forth. And so wherever you have flowing current and you have some sort of a sediment like that, you'll get these sand waves that will set up. Um, the thing is, is typically on a beach you'll see sand waves and they'll only be about an inch tall and maybe peak to peak that much. These are about three meters tall, or, or taller than I am, and, and they have a wavelength, you know, peak to peak of, of maybe four or five meters. So it's, uh, 
they're significantly bigger and you know the, the greater the current is the greater those sand waves will be and certainly in places like Long Island Sound where you have the race those we've seen sand waves that can get up to uh, 10 meters tall so about 30 feet 32 feet so it's they, they can get quite large and, and accumulate and uh, so anyways I this thing that's kind of pretty um, <coughs> This is an interesting thing uh, for anybody who follows sea level rise. This is, uh, this is actually a drowned riverbed um, up in Beam Canal, Alaska. And so the river actually comes out here, and you can see where the old river ran. So this is all submerged. This is all underwater right now. So at some point, um, at, a, at a glacial maxima, when, when the sea level was much, much lower, this is where the river ran. But as the sea level has risen, um, basically this riverbed has gotten drowned, but the riverbed is still there and it's clearly seen in our data, um, which is pretty amazing. <coughs> this shows up better on my computer. It's a little, maybe a little hard to see. Can anybody, anybody see that? Can you see that back there? Yeah. What does it look like? It looks like, almost like ice in fractal pieces. Yeah. Looks like a galaxy. <clears throat> well, I don't know if you can make it out, but it, it sort of looks like there's chopsticks or like somebody dropped a box of, of uh, toothpicks on the floor. And this is, uh, this is in a place called Ward Cove up in Alaska. And, and this, was in a, this was the sea floor beneath a log holding pen. So basically they would have these areas, they would float logs down the river and, and they would pin them all up. But what happened is a lot of those logs would get waterlogged and they would sink to the seafloor and they'd just sit there. So you can see where you know a lot of their profit went. It's all sitting on the seafloor down there. So and there's also a little wreck right up in here that's uh, that's sitting up in that data. And so we frequently do find wrecks, which is also a good point of excitement for a long cruise. Um, and this is uh, this is again just I, I just think some neat neat. Uh, geology that, that we get to see, and this was at the south end of Baranoff Island, um, at, so at the uh, south end of Chatham Strait up in Alaska, and so you can see, you, you know, the <coughs> striation from the glacial uh, retreat is, is very prevalent in this, which I just think is very interesting. So uh, anyways, I think that, yes sir? I, I'm seeing a kind of divot that's kind of going across the north area. Yeah. That's good that? that you knew that it was in the north. Thank you. <laughs> right here? Yeah. Yes. And I think that that's probably a fault in the rocks. So that's a crack in those rocks because the, the glacier here would have been moving north-south. So you can see where it's like, you can see where it's just kind of like got its claws in the ground right there, right? As it drug down this way or actually it was going to the north. So as it just kind of dragged its claws across the earth and receded to the north, it just scarred the, the seafloor right there. So, all of that work that we had done was all for, for um, doing our nautical charting. And that's our primary role. But we also do, we use that same technology, you know, our multi-beams and our other sonars that we have in the sensors to support other efforts as well. So, um, marine biologists typically let, love to get our data because we're able to show them an amazing amount of detail. And so from from their ability to determine habitat from that data, um, it, it has become a real hot source of, of information for that. So you can see this, this is uh, data that I'd acquired on one of my other ships down in the dry Tortugas. So each of these things that look like little, you know, little warts here are actually coral reefs. So they're independent coral reefs on a, on a sandy seafloor here. Um, and so, for somebody, for, for somebody who is into the corals program, which NOAA does a lot of, you know, being able to delineate where the coral is and where it's not is incredibly important. Uh, marine geologists as well, like we've been talking about, a lot of the stuff that we've been looking at is pure marine geology. So to be able to use this data, all this kind of silver colored data is all hydrography that was acquired by USGS, and they were able to identify all of these uh, um, these canyons here, uh, so there's Santa Monica Canyon here, 
There's the uh, San Paulo uh, Canyon here. And so this is where, again, when the water level was back along this area here, um, you know, say 10,000 years ago, this is where the riverbeds would run right here. So being able to see how those geological processes worked over, you know, centuries uh, allows us to kind of predict where things are going. And, and so looking under the water is as important as, as looking at what we can see above the water. Um, coastal engineers, I'm not sure if you can see, this is an oil rig here. And you've got one, two, three, four, five, six tugboats pulling that thing out to sea in the sky, I think is, is the brakes for that whole arrangement. So these are incredibly expensive platforms, billions of dollars to get those things up and running. And once you get it out, you want to make sure that when you set it down onto the seafloor or go to anchor it, that you've got it anchored in the right spot and the seafloor is what you expect it to be because you really don't want that thing drifting off um, in a place that nobody knows about it. Um, marine archaeologists as well. This is a uh, scuttled German uh, ship in Scapa Flow. So some of uh, the people that I worked with during my graduate work, um, they had surveyed uh, all of that area um, in Scapa Flow, and they also did the D-Day invasion site, which I believe I've got on here as well. Um, this is uh, the Titanic expedition. So one of our um, Young hydrographers had a chance. He was working with our Office of Ocean Exploration, and um, uh, Dr. Bob Ballard was going to go back with the folks when they were making the Titanic, the movie, and uh, do some analysis of the wreck itself and see. And so he was able to go back and be part of that mapping team when they went back to the t Titanic, which was a it was a real amazing experience for him. Um, this is the. This was from the D-Day invasion, so here's an image of a Sherman tank here. And what happened was there were, there were thousands of landing craft on D-Day that were, that were going to be landing on the beaches of Normandy. And because of the, the torrential fire that they were under, many of those landing craft didn't make it. And some of them uh, were to discharge their tanks offshore, so they thought that they could make it. So a lot of the crew on the tanks would load themselves into the tank and literally drive off the ramp of these landing craft, you know, only to go to their demise because they were not in shallow enough water to, to be able to put their snorkels up. So they would go in and sink. I mean, these were, you know, thousands of pounds of steel. And so you can see down here, this is the data that was acquired on that. You know, so here's the turret, and you can see the gun mount there. And so they still sit just as they did the day that they rolled off that landing craft. It's a, it's a sad testament, but they're, they're all still there right off of D-Day. Many of the ships, the barriers that they put offshore, um, and so they had done that for the uh, D-Day anniversary. How many are down there? That's a good question. I, I wasn't a part of that, uh, that mission, um, but it's, a, it's, I mean, a, a large amount. I would, I would say, you know, nearing 100 of these tanks. And then, you know, some of the ships and other craft that are there, I mean, the whole thing is just a, a you know, just a, you know, it's just a, it's just littered with them. So it's amazing. So these are uh, coming forward. Back in 1807, most of the work was done with lead line, which is basically a giant measuring or a, or a uh, tape. Um, at that point, it was a tiller cord with a, with bronze, with a bronze core and a cotton sleeve around the outside with a large weight on the end. Um, that's how they would measure that um, back in the 1800s. Very slow, limited by depth. Um, they, they developed a Sigsby sounding machine, which uh, was able to allow them to go deeper. And that used a piano wire, had much less drag, and they could actually get deeper and were able to get some full ocean depth measurements, but it was very finicky and you didn't want to put any stress on that because it would pop. Um, after the wreck of the Titanic, I'm sorry, yes, the Titanic, they, uh, um, echo sounders came into play and so for many years, 50 years, we had uh, single beam echo sounders, which is pretty much what you find on all fishing vessels today or any pleasure craft, and that was our primary um, means of 
of, uh, of getting depth measurements. And now we use, uh, like I said before, multi-beam data for that. And uh, we're able to cover a much larger swath. And you can see what we find in the middle of when we do that. And, and so as we resurvey areas that have been surveyed prior, it's amazing the things that we do come up with. And, and, our, and our forefathers did an amazing job surveying. Some of the things that they found with a lead line were astounding to me, but um, they, they weren't perfect. And so the new technology really allows us to provide a level of confidence with our, with our data that we were was completely unheard of in the past. Um, again, we also use a side scan. I, I took that out. We don't do a whole lot of that on the, on the West Coast, but certainly on the East Coast. Um, you can go 200 nautical miles offshore and it still will um, be about as deep it is, as it is about a mile offshore here on the west coast. So, you know, uh, 200 miles offshore on the east coast, it's, you know, maybe 100 feet deep. And so, because of that shallow nature, there's a tremendous amount of uh, shipwrecks on the east coast. And because it is so shallow, it's also a lot more difficult to survey. So. We, get a, we use a different type of sonar out there, and that allows us to image the seafloor um, more than actually um, acquire depth on. Um, this was another expedition that some of our folks had been on. This was uh, uh, Dr. Bob Ballard. Some of you may have seen him on the, on the Science Channel, on the Discovery Channel. He had led a Black Sea expedition. Um, and what they were finding was uh, they were actually finding entire merchant ships that were thousands of years old. And in the Black Sea, once you get below a certain layer, you reach what they call an anoxic zone. And in that zone, there, well, exactly as the name implies, there's no oxygen. So since there's no oxygen, nothing lives. Anything that gets put down there gets basically perfectly preserved. So they were unearthing uh, these, these old uh, um, ships that were there, Phoenician ships, and what they were finding was they could actually still see the ads marks where they had, you know, the hand tool marks on the wood in, in these ships as they, as they unearthed them. And one of the things that they found were these amphorae here, and you can see it's basically a clay pot, and they would, they would stack these in the bilge of the ship, and these carried wine. As they pulled these, uh, these amphora up, Many of them still had the cork and the wax seal on them, and they they know that they were able to date these to be several thousand thousands of years old. And the, and Dr. Ballard was actually able to open one of these things and still had wine inside it. And so I think, from what I understand, I wasn't there. They were actually able to take this thousand-year-old wine and. and tasted it. I don't think it was very good, but just the fact that, you know, you can say on your been there, done that list that I got to taste the thousand year old wine is pretty amazing. And this is another, uh, this, this is what side scan data looks like, and this was the other sonar type that we use on the East Coast, and this was, this was the wreck of the U.S. Uh, submarine S-5. This has got a, kind of an interesting story here. It, uh, you can see it, it was launched in, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. This is it on its launching day. And it sailed down on a big victory lap as, it, you know, as they do when they first launch a vessel. And uh, it had gone in from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, sailed down into Boston, and uh, it hailed another merchant ship that was, uh, they were outbound and the merchant ship was inbound and um, made passing arrangements. And they proceeded out around Cape Cod and were heading straight for Philadelphia because they were going to finish their outfitting in Philadelphia. Well, on the way down, just before they got in, into Delaware Bay, they decided, well, you know what, we, we, we're going to do some exercises. And one of the exercises that they, that they would do is they would do an emergency dive. Now, I'm not a submariner. There may be some in here who could fill me in on this. But as I understand it, everybody basically had a valve to turn to close the valves on the ship because you've got all these ports for air. And the chief of the boat had a valve that he was supposed to turn and I guess got waylaid in the excitement and didn't get it shut. Well, the ship started to go down. Water began, uh, began to flood into the submarine and um, luckily they were able to get it shut, but they found themselves, it flooded the battery compartment so they had no power, no lights, 
and they had, and here they are all sitting on the sea floor off of Delaware Bay in this big giant tin can. And so the captain was a pretty smart guy. I think he was an engineer and figured out, well, you know what? If we if we um, if we reroute some of our electricity and, and, and move it to another battery bank that we have forward, I think we can pump all the water to the, to the bow of the ship. And by doing that, the, the stern will rise up and they knew that the water depth that they were in was shallow enough that the, that the stern would actually break the sea surface. So they all were excited about this because nobody wanted to stay there, right? <laughs> um, and so they got, that, they got that water pumping and they got it moving and they got the, the ship standing literally on its nose. So the nose of the submarine was on the seafloor and the prop and the, and the, and the uh, stern fins were sticking above the water. And how they did this, I don't know, but they were actually able to bore a hole through the steel of that submarine and they tied a white t-shirt on a, on a broom <laughs> handle and they were sticking it through that, that hole and waving it. Well, that very same ship that they had made passing arrangements with in Boston had followed them back down and was, you know, six hours behind them and came by and they see this propeller sticking up out of the water. And so the captain on the merchant ship was like, well, I've got to go see what this is all about. And so they lowered the captain's boat and they rowed over to it and, uh, and, and came alongside and he yelled into this hole. He said, you know, well, what ship is this? And they said, well, we're the S5. And he said, well, very good. He said, well, where are you bound today? <laughs> and the captain was there, and you know, not only was he an engineer, he had a good sense of humor, and he said, well, by compass, we're bound for hell, because they were pointing straight down into the earth. So they tried to, they tried, they were able to get all the crew out, they were able to get the um, submarine refloated evacuated all the crew, um, but they were never able to get it into Philly because it just kept, it just kept flooding and flooding, and, and so it still rests there. And uh, it had been lost for a number of years, and, and, and my ship went out, and we were actually able to find it, so that was a real, that was a real interesting find to see it. So you can see this is the, the wreck here, and, and the way the side scan works is it casts shadows, so this big shadow here is actually the shadow from the conning tower on the submarine. And um, this is the bow of it here, so it's a bit like, you know, reading uh, tarot cards, I think, but once you get used to it, you can usually pick those things out. Uh, this is another U-boat uh, that uh, the um, Office of Exploration was, was uh, looking into. Um, and this is another one. We, we actually surveyed this on, on my ship and then um, provided coordinates for where it was at, and then uh, the Navy came in and helped us salvage it, but it was the... Uh, the monitor, and um, this is the Navy, they had a giant Navy tug that recovered the turret on the monitor, and they brought that aboard, and they brought it to the Mariner's Museum, it's currently sitting at the Mariner's Museum in uh, Newport News, Virginia, and so um, basically what happened is it's like, a, it looks like a giant tuna fish can, I mean, except it's like a really big one, and when that, when the monitor foundered in the, in the hurricane, it rolled over and that was just sitting on the deck based on gravity. There were, it wasn't uh, attached with any positive means. So once the ship rolled over, that, that uh, turret just literally fell to the sea floor. And many of the contents from the ship fell into it and ultimately sediment you know, started to fill it up. And so as they brought it up, they ended up taking it in and excavating it. And this is what this gentleman is doing here. They're going through very meticulously and excavating that, and um, and so you can see this in this bucket here is um, is a boot that they found, this, an intact boot that had been on the ocean floor that entire time, and and they've actually had to get forensic expert because you can see that that is a leg bone that's actually sticking out of the top of it that was still intact in that shoe. So they were pulling out, you know, actually intact human remains after that being on the sea floor for hundreds of years. So, you know, I realize it's maybe a little bit gross, but to me, from a scientific standpoint, it's, it's absolutely amazing that that, that that was able to survive under the, sea, under the sea for that long. So, just a pitch for all the young people who may be looking for a job in like 10 years. This is a great job. So, I've had a chance in my 20-year career working for NOAA. I've 
basically been up and down the entire East Coast. Um, I've had a chance to go to Alaska now twice, which is an amazing place that I absolutely love. Um, this was one of my, this is my second ship. Um, we went all over the Caribbean, so we surveyed Key West and the Virgin Islands, which is not bad duty. Um, <laughs> and uh, and I've, you know, I've met my wife on my ship. Uh, well, she wasn't on my ship, it was in one of the ports that I pulled into. So it's, uh, it, it's, been a, it's been an absolutely wonderful uh, career, and one that, that I think most people in the United States don't know either you know, what it is and how we work and what we do, let alone the, the interesting opportunities that come along with it. Um, as part of my work, I was able to go to graduate school as well, and uh, as part of that graduate um, position, I was able to go to the Arctic, and so I, I, uh, I sailed on board the Coast Guard Gutter, Cutter Healy as a scientist, and uh, so again, on your life's list of really cool things that you got to do in life, this was certainly one of them. So to go and pull into an ice flow and get to walk around the ship and have a beer on the ice, that's, a, that's a pretty amazing. And, and to map places that are actually under the ice from an icebreaker. Again, scientifically, that's, that's pretty neat. And, and certainly one of the, you know, as, as my closing picture, uh, you know, while we were there, we actually got to see a polar bear. So that certainly is, again, another real life life thing to see. So um, very exciting, a wonderful uh, career and a wonderful opportunity and certainly one that I would absolutely <coughs> recommend to anybody who, who is interested in the ocean and science. So for that, I would love to entertain any questions. Yes, sir. Men and women are in the NOAA Corps. There's only about 320 of us in the NOAA Corps, so it's a very, the officer corps itself is very small. Yes, sir. How many facilities, no facilities, are there in the country? Oh, uh, I don't know that. I, uh, ship wise, for ship ports, we have um, I think we have six ship ports. So there's one in the Hawaiian Islands here on the west coast. We have a ship that's out of San Diego. Um, there's the Gulf Port. Um, our major port is in, is in um, Norfolk, Virginia, but we also have some subports that are in um, New Hampshire and Woods Hole. But, uh, I mean, across the country there are thousands of, of NOAA um, labs and offices. You know, when you think of the National Weather Service, uh, the National Marine Fisheries, the National Marine Sanctuaries, um, I, I'm not even sure how many there are. Are you responsible for the Great Lakes as well? We are, yes. And we, there had been a big survey push um, back in the 80s, and we used to send ships up there um, every year to survey in the Great Lakes. Um, and they were pretty well surveyed, and, and now we just do kind of spot maintenance on those. So, Yes, sir, the man in the back with a good question. Um, if you go a long way back, there was a big ridge, I remember, but there were what looked like sandways around it, but they were almost completely straight. Straight. Meaning there were no deviations practically. I don't think I recall seeing a single, I don't think I recall seeing a single groove or line. So I'm going to give you my card. I'm not sure that could be, there could be all sorts of things. A lot of times when, when you put a rock in the middle of a sand, a field of sand and you let water flow around it, it does some really exciting things. So I, my guess is that there was something hard there that was making it do that. Just a guess. Yes, sir. Did your ship ever get like real damage or damage at all? Luckily, no. We are very careful with that ship, although, and so we have, we do drills every week. And so we, we are, when we're at sea, there's no fire department to call, and there's no policeman to call, and there's there's no repairman to call. So that's why we have 45 people on board, and so we are our own fire department. So we actually have people on board that dress out, and if you saw them, they would look just like a fireman. So they have a fire helmet on and a mask, and then what we call an SCBA, which is a self-contained breathing apparatus. So they have what looks like a scuba tank on their back, 
And so if we have a fire, then we, we do that, but we try really hard not to touch the seafloor. Is that what you meant? <laughs> yeah. I just told you about the sonars that backed on Hurricane Katrina. Yeah. 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 That's a good question. The, the, the sonars that we are using are fairly high frequency compared to the, you know, the sensitivity range for most marine mammals. So we're operating about 400 kilohertz. Many of those are down you know, in, the, you know, in the 40 to 60 hertz range. So they operate much lower. So I mean, you know, in, in the range for the sound that we're putting into the water is, is very short. So the problem that we have is not so much you know, hurting the marine mammals as piquing their curiosity. And so what we find is a lot of times the marine mammals will come flocking to us. And certainly with a, with a toad side scan, which is, a, which is another one of our sonars, um, we've had it where we've had to actually pull it in because the dolphins became so amorous with our sonar that we had to get it out of the water so that they would just go away and then we can start our survey again. But there are there are other sonars that are not like that. A lot of the seismic work, um, they, they call them sparkers or, or uh, you know, they, they basically they create a small explosion and those things put out an incredible amount of sound and those are the ones that are typically responsible for a lot of the, you know, the cetaceous damage that, that occurs. So. Um, but they, they have, you know, they're operating like at the, you know, the one to twenty hertz range, so really low frequency because it's not only going through the water column, but it's going through the sediment as well and going down thousands of meters into the sediment. So to penetrate that, it has to be low frequency and high power. So those are the ones which we do not use. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, here, is there any uh, work done out here on the power? Do you ever see what it looks like on the bottom? Uh, there's a rumor around that there's a mountain range out there that's going to break up the tsunami when it comes in. We like to comfort ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any to that theory? Um, so, it depends on what you would call a mountain range. I, I would say not. I mean, there is the continental shelf, but that's not going to help us on a tsunami because basically what happens is, and so there are mountain ranges out there, yes ma'am, but they're very far out and they're not close enough that I would consider them a wave break for any tsunami coming in. So, yes sir. Is there any surveying being done by satellite? Um, yes. It's... Yes. So, one of, a, one of our NOAA re researchers, um, his name is Walter um, Smith, has actually done some really interesting work um, taking satellite altimetry. And by measuring the water's surface many times, as these, these satellites go across the, the ocean surface, they, they are able to, you know, by multiple measurements, figure out what the altimetry or the, the height of the, the water is. And so what he was able to figure out was that as the, as the sea, you know, as the ocean flows over a, you know, a, a, you know, an oceanic mountain, for, for instance, the water mounds up around that, that mountain. And so it takes the shape of the seafloor below it. And so he's been able to come up with a transfer function that basically in a very coarse <coughs> Since has been able to map the sea floor from the satellite, but it's very coarse. So basically, he has you know one one depth measurement, if you will, per kilometer. So the the accuracy of that is really low, and and the resolution of it is very low, and so it's not to the level that that you would want to trust in navigation. But for large you know, geologic and tectonic activity, it's really great because they've been able to confirm where they believe the mid-Atlantic trench is and the, you know, the various Pacific trenches are and where the spreading plates and the spreading boundaries are. So in that regard, I think it's provided some confirmation, but it's, it's not to the level that, that he would like. And I know he had, he's, he's been very vocal about being more ocean mapping going, you know, to mapping, because right now, 
I, I think we've got less than 10% of the world's oceans mapped. So we've got you know, the moon mapped better than we have our own oceans. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, have you ever seen the actual mount that's about two to 300 miles off the seaside? Uh, I've seen uh, some side sonar pictures of it. I thought that was good. I haven't, not here, but I know that there's a number, there's a whole, up in, up in the Gulf of Alaska, there's the, there's the Seamount District, as they call it up yeah. there, and, and there's just Seamount after Seamount after Seamount, and so I know that there are, there are some offshore, I haven't, I haven't <coughs> surveyed any of the stuff off the coast of, any of the seafloor off the coast of Oregon, usually we're heading straight to Alaska, so we go out the jetty and bang a right and keep going for seven days, so... Yes, ma'am. What is the best resolution you can get vertical and horizontal with the multi-beam sonar? Um, <coughs> if, if, we, if we correct for um, our satellites, we can get down to uh, some to sub-centimeter positional accuracy, and we're able to get a resolution in shallow water and so by shallow water, I would say, let's say less than 100. You can, you can see incredibly small detail. So, you know, I would say at 100 meters, you might have about um, 10 to 20 centimeters resolution on the seafloor. And the position at bore side of that, you might have down to, you know, say less than five centimeters. Um, shallower than that, it, it's, it obviously gets better. Um, because you've got a, you've got sound velocity, or, you know, kind of the ray tracing issues through the water, et cetera. But we've been able to measure sand waves like those ones that I showed you <coughs> off of Martha's Vineyard that were, you know, they were, you know, one inch by one inch, and you could actually see it over repetitive surveys over a number of days how how they moved <coughs> on the seafloor. So we can get in incredibly detailed with that. Yes, ma'am. Either one of you. Is there anywhere available for the normal people to see up at the central coast what it looks like offshore? Is there anything clear enough that makes sense to any of us? Is it available? Um, from, from a mapping data standpoint, uh, there is. Um, is I have to think Noble? about that. Is it on the Noble website? <coughs> There's a couple of places. Actually, Google Ocean is really wonderful, and they've got a lot of stuff there. Um, <clears throat> and they've got a number of, you know, where they have data, they've been putting that up, and we've been working with colleagues of, of mine at, at Google to get our data onto Google Earth so that it's that it's viewable by the general public in a, in a better way. A lot of the data that we have is geared, unfortunately, more for the scientific community. And so it's in a format that, unless you have particular software, can be kind of troublesome for the, you know, for the <coughs> average person to go out and, and do. Um, but there, there are bathymetric maps, and I believe Noah um, has some of them that are, that are quite good. And, but I, I would, the ones that I would look at would be on, on Google. <coughs> yes, ma'am, you had one too? No, that was the same question. Same question? OK. Yes, sir. When you talked about the uniform services, you didn't mention the Merchant Marine. Where are they? Um, I don't, th they're not technically listed as um, a uniform service unto themselves. Typically, they, they have, the, the folks that um, graduate from the Merchant Marine Academy, um, they typically have a reserve commission in the Navy. And so that's it. so they end up falling under the Navy. So with any luck, we'll still have one of those academies. They've been they've been under extreme uh, fire recently. So we used to do all of our training at the Merchant Marine Academy, and, and it's uh, the, the funding has gotten severely <coughs> restricted from them. And questions you know exist currently. One of uh, I'm friends with one of the instructors there that whether they would even stay open in the future. So. Yes, sir. Are there other missions operating out of the Newport facility? Oh yes, absolutely. So I mean, each one of our ships has a slightly different mission. So 
the Rainier and the Fairweather, um, which are, you know, if you drive over the bridge, we're the two that are kind of closest to the bridge on the pier. We do ocean <coughs> mapping. Um, the, the Fairweather is a little more general purpose ocean mapping, so I know she did a um, ocean acidification survey this summer where they were going and taking water sample measurements up and down running transect, line, transect lines from Seattle all the way down to uh, California. But <coughs> Shimada is currently in. She does fisheries research and a number of, of uh, um, fishery studies, um, typically down off the coast of uh, California. Uh, the Dyson um, typically comes into port there uh, in the winter, and, and she's also a fishery survey vessel. Um, but most of it is all shipboard operations out of, out of, out of the uh, Marine Operations Center Pacific, um, which is where the ships tie up. Um, there are other NOAA offices that are at Hatfield that do all, all number of things, and I, I'm not well versed enough in what all they have, but I know they've got a broad range of science missions that they perform there, so. Yes, ma'am. Along that same line, uh, does NOAA have uh, research vessels at all uh, we do. Um, the, the, the work that the Fairweather did about ocean acidification was, was directly related to the climate change because of, because of that. The CO2 loading in the ocean is going up and that's causing you know, the acidity in the ocean to go up. But the, the Ron Brown, our, you know, our flagship, um, she, she does quite a bit of atmospheric research and, and um, that's one of her primary missions. Most of the, most of the climate change work is, is dealt with, uh, you know, obviously under the National Weather Service, but they've also, you know, in recent years stood up a, a climate office or within NOAA. So, so um, not, well, not within NOAA it wasn't controversial, but within the government it was controversial. So. Yes, ma'am. Um, I heard, that, I read somewhere that NOAA in Newport sometimes has an open house for the public. That's a really good question. Um, we have, last year, I think we had 1,800 people come to our ships, you know, uh, during various uh, open houses. Um, and so I know we've got a, we have the Isaac Newton Magnet School. Um, we're doing an open house for them on, on the two ships um, in December and, and have about 140 students coming on board. So we absolutely love to get the public on board and show them what we do. and. And uh, we actually, one thing I would, I would put out to all of you here, and you can needle your teachers, is uh, we have a teacher at sea program as well. And we had, we had six teachers at sea, seven teachers at sea this summer that sailed with us. One of them was from Lincoln City, and, and one of them was from uh, Isaac Newton Magnet School. So they come out, um, Noah, assuming that Noah gets funded to do that, um, pays for their travel, and once they're on the ship, it's basically like living in a hotel. They get three meals a day and a bed and, you know, everything. But, uh, so all they have to do in return is, is write, a, write a blog and keep a record of what they do, and they post that to the internet every day and take pictures. And so we just kind of put them in with our science team, and they go out every day and do whatever mission our scientists are doing, and it's a great thing. And so we love having them on board. They love coming with us. And, and so as far as kind of reinvigorating, you know, that science side of their brain, they love getting out. And, and, and so it's a, it's a real win-win. So I, certainly I would, you know, the, it's, a, it's called the Teacher at Sea Program, NOAA's Teacher at Sea Program. If you have any teachers that you're friends with, you certainly point them in that direction. So. And so I'm sorry, I, I don't think I really answered your question. Um, I, I'd be... I, I, I've got cards. I'd be happy to give you a card and, and uh, yes. Well, I don't have a card, but um, I think I had an open house during the tuna, the Alba Corps tuna barbecue uh, in the last two years. It was also the anniversary of the Mach P. So I think they had open houses then. They also had a big article in the newspaper, a whole separate section about the tuna barbecue. But certainly, I, you know, I'm going a, a little bit out on a limb here, but I mean, with a body of people this big, I mean, if, if, if you ever were interested in doing that, um, you know, we could certainly make special arrangements for a, you know, for, for a tour that way. Um, it, it, unfortunately, the, the tours 
The best time for the tours is in the winter because the ships are in port and they're there. But it, it's also kind of a difficult time because I, you know we're supposed to leave sometime in January to go to the shipyard, and so a lot of times there's repairs going on and people are on vacation. So while the ships are there, you know they're not always fully staffed. So it does take a little bit of planning, but certainly it can be done. Yes, sir. I would love to give you one. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I just wanted to ask how you're funding this. How are you surviving the How are you surviving the We've been able to tighten our belts amazingly, but uh, it's, 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 we're pretty thin. Just to maybe the best way to describe it is we typically, in <coughs> When I first came in as an ensign, we were doing about 230 to 240 days at sea a year. So that means the ship would be away from home port doing its mission or out at sea for 200 and, you know, say not only 220, 240 days a year. This year, my ship's got 98 days. So we're down to less than 100. So it's a, you know, it's, it, in my mind, it's a, I, I find it really frustrating because that's a capital asset that you have that while it's sitting at the pier is not doing anything for you. So it's bad for my crew because they're not, they're not staying proficient in all the things that they need to stay proficient in. And, and, you know, the ship is nothing but a giant machine. And so any machine that sits still for too long, you know, has all sorts of problems. So it, it stays working much better when it's constantly in motion. So it, 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 it provides, you know, difficulties all the way around in managing that ship, managing the personnel, and managing the, you know, the physical plant of it. So it's, 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 it's tough. All right. I guess I've exhausted all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you.